Over the ocean, just off the Australian west coast, a Qantas Airbus A330 is cruising calmly, coming in from Singapore. But suddenly, the piece is disturbed and the plane pitches down towards the sea without warning. Quickly, the pilots recover, but the situation is not over. Find out with me today what happened here, and subscribe so you won't miss any future episodes. Welcome to Airspace. On October 7, 2008, Qantas 72 had already completed the larger part of its journey from Singapore to Perth, Australia. It was cruising at 37,000 feet. The mainland had already been in sight when suddenly the autopilot disconnected out of nowhere. The crew was presented with the fault of one of the inertial reference units, that is one of the computers that calculates the plane's attitude in the air. But just seconds later, the pilots also received simultaneous stall and overspeed warnings. These warnings came and went and put the pilots on high alert because something was clearly wrong. As it was a bright and sunny afternoon, the pilots could see that nothing had changed and the plane was still flying as before, definitely not in a stall. Also, from the first officer's instruments and from the standby indicators, they could deduce that they were not in an overspeed situation either. Troubleshooting began and as a first measure, the pilots attempted to re-engage the autopilot. Autopilot 1 would not connect, but Autopilot 2 did. Glad to have found some relief to the situation, the pilots focused their efforts on finding out what was wrong. But just 16 seconds later, the autopilots disconnected again and the captain had to fly by hand. A very delicate process at 37,000 feet, where the air is very thin. Only very minimal control inputs should be done at that altitude. As he was getting situated to the unusual flying situation, suddenly the A330 pitched down violently. The plane lowered its nose from a pitch of about 2.5 degrees nose up to minus 8 degrees nose down and produced a negative acceleration of about minus 0.8 g. That means, for everything that was not safely strapped down, gravity more or less flipped. Suitcases, food trolleys, flight attendants and passengers were thrown to the ceiling violently, resulting in many injuries and substantial damage to the plane's cabin. Luckily, the pilots were strapped in, otherwise they would have been thrown out of their seats, leaving the plane without guidance. The captain immediately tried to recover, but felt that the plane would not respond for several moments. When the plane was flying again in a stable manner at 37,000 feet, the pilots once again tried to determine what was wrong with their Airbus, but soon they were interrupted again by a second but less violent instance of the plane putting its nose towards the sea. Again, the captain tried to recover, but felt that the plane would only respond after a few seconds. After that, the pilots were finally able to attend their checklists and hopefully fix the problem. But what they found was a complete mess. The checklists and faults kept appearing and disappearing. What they could see was the fact that the captain's inertial reference units had failed, as well as two of the three primary flight control computers. The crew was able to fix some of the problems with computer resets, but many of the faults kept coming back. At least, they seemed to have full control of the plane now, and no further pitch down upsets occurred. The captain decided to continue flying by hand as he found it to be the most stable. Seeing that they had very strange flight control computer problems that they could not figure out and considering the many injured on board, the pilots decided to land as soon as possible and divert the A330 to Learmonth here in Western Australia. During the descent, the crew conducted the flight control check to be sure about the aircraft's response during the approach. The captain reported that he was very cautious at that time since he was afraid that the plane would once again pitch down while they were close to the ground. But the aircraft did not do so again, fortunately, and the A330 landed in Learmonth without further events. Paramet exploded the plane and took care of the passengers. 119 of the 315 occupants received injuries, 12 of them serious. The aircraft remained structurally intact, but the cabin was significantly damaged. Of the injured passengers, most did not wear their seatbelts at the time of the upset. Immediately after the aircraft was on the ground, the investigation into the matter began. It would be one of the longer ones, taking three years and producing a 313-page final report. More surprisingly, the culprit of the strange aircraft behavior was quickly found when the investigators looked at the flight data recorder data. Take a look at these values. They represent, among others, speed and angle of attack of the plane. The angle of attack is not the pitch value of the aircraft, but the measure of the direction in which the air meets the aircraft. It is used to provide various functions, such as the stall protection and others. All looks normal until a moment in time marked with a black bar. After that, suddenly the data seems to be corrupted, showing erratic spikes. 
According to this data, the angle of attack value fluctuated rapidly between 2.5 degrees and 50 degrees. At 50 degrees, the plane would be in a deep stall, which was clearly not the case. All other aircraft parameters seemed normal on the flight data recorder. But when this erroneous angle of attack data was delivered to the flight control computers, they immediately activated the stall protection, because they believed the aircraft was in a very serious stall. It was this protection that pushed the nose down. To understand this accident, let's have a look at the A330's computers that measure air data, such as speed, altitude and angle of attack. This is all done using several probes and sensors that connect to three of these boxes. They are called Air Data and Inertial Reference Units, or in short, ADIRUs. As the name says, they do not process only air data, but they also measure the plane's attitude. Three identical ADIRUs are installed to provide maximum redundancy. These computers provide data to the primary flight control computers, of which there are also three. These ADIRUs also monitor each other. If they sense that one of them is returning values that are nonsense, this ADIRU then produces a fault warning and shuts itself off. But wait a minute, just before I described that one of these computers, the ADIRU1, produced weird spiky data, should it not have been flagged as erroneous then? Absolutely, yes, but this only happened for inertial data, not for air data measurements such as angle of attack. But why did this not happen? It was this part that the investigators struggled with. You see, the manufacturer of this ADRU really thought about a lot of things when he designed these computers. What if a value suddenly spikes? What if a value runs away slowly? And what if a value spiked over and over? For all these problems, there was an algorithm for determining such a failure. If one of three ADRUs delivered a value that was significantly different from the other two, the algorithm would wait one second, then check the value again. If it was still out of range by then, the value would be rejected and a fault message generated. However, the spikes in the case of Qantas 7-2 were spaced in a way that they escaped the algorithm. A spike was happen, the algorithm would start watching it, and a second later, all seemed to be well again and no fault was generated. The flight control computer's data processing idea behind this algorithm is also rather ingenious, one would assume. ADIRU 1, 2 and 3 are compared continuously. For flight control inputs, normally ADIRU 1 and 2 are used. If suddenly ADIRU 1 were to fall out of line, the last correct value would be memorized and used for 1.2 seconds, while the algorithm that I described before takes just one second to figure out if the value is really wrong. If it is really wrong, the value would be rejected, and 0.2 seconds later, when the memorization period ends, the angle of attack calculation would base on ADIRU 2 and 3, which would provide correct values. But in the case of Qantas 7-2, something very insidious happened that the developers did not consider. A spike happened that was very short, triggering the algorithm and the memorization period of this last value. After a second, the spike was gone and the algorithm flagged the value as still valid. But just after this, and before the 1.2 second memorization period ended, another spike appeared that lasted just long enough to persist through the end of this period. As all values were still flagged as valid, the average of the angles of attack measured by ADIRU 1 and 2 were used, resulting in a calculated angle of attack of 26 degrees, which would signify a deep stall at this altitude. Seeing this value, the flight control computers immediately triggered the stall protection and lowered the nose aggressively. During this period, any pitch up input by the pilots is rejected by the flight control computers, since they think they are in a stall and pitching up would only aggravate the situation. After two seconds, the spike was gone and all was well again in the eyes of the computers and control was returned to the pilots. This very unfortunate combination of shortly spaced spikes that eluded the detection mechanism happened twice, resulting in sudden pitch down motions. But what triggered these spikes? It seems odd that all kinds of values would spike all over the place, but nevertheless, investigators checked all instruments and found them to be in perfect working order. Therefore, the focus of the investigation fell on the ADIRUs themselves. Could the box itself be faulty? During the investigation of the electronics and the software of the ADRU, someone discovered something odd. All kinds of values are processed by the unit, such as altitude, airspeed, angle of attack and so on. To get these values into a format that is understood by computers, they are packaged into short data packets, 32 bits long. That sounds complicated, but it essentially just means that each value that is processed by the unit is packaged into strings of ones and zeros, 32 digits long. The first digits tell the computer what kind of value this is, for example altitude or angle of attack. 
It was here that an investigator made a discovery. While the A330 was cruising at 37,000 feet, its altitude was transformed into ones and zeros for the computer, looking like this. If you change the type of this value from altitude to angle of attack, the result would no longer be read as 37,000 feet, but as 50.625 degrees angle of attack. This change required two ones and zeros to be switched in the type data field. If this still sounds complicated, look at this word. Would you say it's pronounced elite or let? Just as we humans can interpret one word as something different, so can a computer. The investigation spent a lot of time finding out how this data corruption could have happened. They looked at electromagnetic interference from cockpit instruments, from cell phones, or even looked at a conspiracy theory stating that the military radio station located on the western coast of Australia could have caused this. They even took test flights and measured cosmic radiation and satellite radiation. In the end, the investigation was not able to determine what exactly caused the ADRU to behave in that way. After the accident, Airbus modified its failure detection algorithm so that such a failure mode cannot reoccur. Northrop Grumman, the manufacturer of these ADRUs, stated that it is looking into improvements to the central processing units of the ADRUs, making such an occurrence even less likely. It also implemented additional self-testing mechanisms to the unit so that it could better detect such failures. But to give you some perspective of how unlikely that case was, this unit model is quite popular and is used worldwide. During its cumulative use of over 128 million hours, there are just three known instances of it producing such spikes. Qantas compensated their passengers, but several of them took legal action against the airline. One flight attendant was left with permanent disabilities, and the captain of the flight even wrote a book about that day. While it may sound trivial and abstract that the plane pitched down twice and left people injured, one has to always consider the people involved. I'm sure many of them are left with permanent marks of that day, either physically or psychologically, as is the case for most aircraft accidents. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you liked this week's video, and I hope that it wasn't too complicated. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. See you in the next one.